So I have a question in terms of social security and specifically elderly benefits. And along with the problems that you point out, obviously we also have a demographic issue, which a lot of economists, actually um, Boskin, who I, I understand was a Hoover fellow, yeah. um, talks about specifically the graying population and how that contributes. Even if we return these policies back to their initial intention, um, we still have a graying population who is living longer and increasingly is taking up more of the population. So if you could speak on that, that'd be wonderful. It's a great, it's a great question. Uh, you know, here we are at the, you know, we've gone for the last uh, thir 20 years of raising the debt relative to our economy, right? At a time we should be preparing for what we knew was coming, this demographic bulge of seniors, right? We knew it was coming. And yet we had policies not of preparing for it, but of running up the debt. But it turns out, I think, that the demographic problem is overstated. And here's why. If you were to limit the benefits of Social Security, future benefits, to their real value today, their inflation-adjusted value today, so you don't increase them, you just keep them where they are today, in inflation-adjusted terms, purchasing power the same. You do the same for Medicare. And spending relative to GDP on those two programs will not rise. That is, you will limit the growth in those programs to the rate of growth of the economy. So all those big increases that I showed you would be taken, not all of them, the vast majority of them, would be taken out of the budget. And so yes, demographics is a problem, but it's not as big as the problem of rising expenditures in both of those programs per recipient. Okay? Is we didn't start Social Security at a level that provided benefits that we see today. So a typical couple today will receive in benefits, Social Security benefits, about $70,000 a year. This is far beyond a measure of economic security, right? And so our problem is that we've been increasing the real value of these benefits in Social Security and Medicare over the years. So yes, demographics are important, but if we were to just stop the growth in those programs, we'd go, that would go a long way towards uh, solving our uh, financial uh, fiscal problem. Okay, yes. Well, thank you, sir. My name is uh, Don Parker, I'm a recent uh, graduate from Harvard University and soon to be recipient of Social Security, so go easy if you would. <laughs> but my question is, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the degree to which it matters who holds the debt. And the reason I say that is a good portion of the debt is held by the government itself and the interest payments are used to provide services. And then when the American citizens hold the debt and I get interest payments, I pay tax on the interest payments, I go down the street, get a haircut, buy a shirt, there's tax again. So my question is, how important is it or what effect is there of who holds that debt? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So the, what I've tried to emphasize is that the economic cost, if you will, comes from ultimately from higher spending. Because that higher spending takes resources away from the productive side of society and transforms them into, we'll call it, consumption services. And that's the primary effect of, of, uh, of uh, spending and then borrowing. And so it's a, if you will, it's a, think about it as an opportunity cost. You're taking money out of a productive, pri relative productive private sector and transforming it into consumption. So you're reducing investment in the private sector and innovation and putting it towards pure consumption today. And that's really where the cost comes from, okay? So I don't know if that gets at your, your question, but we tend to think about the problem as debt or the problem as taxes. I sort of see the problem as spending. And when you spend, you've got to withdraw resources away from the private sector and put them to public sector uses. And as I said, if this money that we were borrowing from the private sector went to investments, and these in government investments were as productive as, as the private sector, 
then all the borrowing in the world wouldn't have an adverse effect on the economy. Uh, it was just that we're taking money away from the productive side and transforming it into uh, consumption. And by the way, along with that cons consumption comes disincentives for uh, work, for investments in human capital, and for investments in physical capital. Okay, we had a question in the middle here, yeah. My name is Maeve Larko, and I'm from the University of Michigan. Um, I wanted to bring it back to the graph you showed about the percentage of GDP spending. Um, and I was looking at the graph, and at the lowest point um, in around, I chose the year like 1850, kind of right before the Civil War, um, our population, the US population was about 23 million. Um, and today, our population is around 330 million. Um, so our population growth from that time is about 14 million, and the percentage and in increase in spending is about, I believe it was 12%, or uh, excuse okay. me, so it was 15% and then 12%. Yeah. So in, if you think of that proportion, like I guess what's your response to that? Yeah, good, uh, you're right. Think about it a little bit differently. Uh, ask, what was uh, GDP in 1850? and national income in 1850. And what is national income today? It's like, I don't know, somebody should look it up, but it's gotta be like 500 times or 800 times. And that's, the, that's what you wanna to compare to the growth in the population, right? That you, want not, you don't wanna ask, you know, what is the growth in the population compared to the growth in the budget as a percentage of GDP, you might want to ask instead, what's the growth in spending per person after you take out inflation over, you know, from 1850 until today? That would be, right, the right statistic to use. So it might be good, actually, if you could go back into your, you know, your individual sessions and look up what uh, real GDP was in 1850 and make that, that calculation. And I think what you're gonna see is this enormous growth in real inflation-adjusted government spending per beneficiary, per, per, per person in the US population. Make sense? Hello, uh, so thanks for your talk. A key idea on public finance regarding taxes and spending is the recurring equivalence. Uh, suggesting that as economic agents internalize the government's budget constraint, uh, the way of financing greater spending, whether by taxes or debt, does not fundamentally matter. In fact, another Hoover fellow, Robert Barrow, has put forward and elaborated this to make the case for tax smoothing. Uh, I would like to ask you how accurate do you think these ideas are, and are they useful to think about fiscal policy? Yeah, so I think both are very useful for thinking about economic policy uh, in an ideal world. That is, as you step back and you ask, how would I build a model to think about debt uh, and, and taxes and spending? I think both of those approaches are the way, are the way to go. But the reality is, is that you know, for at least 60 years, and actually if you go back to the 30s, we're talking about 90 years, almost a century, we haven't ever raised the taxes to finance the debt that we're issuing. And so this idea that an increase in the uh, debt is associated with an increase in, in taxes while down in the future, while conceptually right, after 100 years or 90 years of failing to do that, people begin to wonder, gee, is the government going to raise taxes to finance that, uh, raise future taxes to finance today's spending? And the answer is probably not. And this gets to a point then that John Cochran has made. Once they start thinking that that's not so, uh, then you start seeing uh, inflation as individuals say, well, gee, I better uh, spend now uh, and, and, uh, uh, and not uh, withhold uh, for future taxes, okay? So I do think that the reality is somewhat at odds with the theory and that's, I mean, Cochran would say, it creates then the inflation that we have today. So there's some discounting of this Ricardian equivalence, I guess is what I'd say. Quick question, expanding on John Cochran's ideas, um, and just curious about your perspective with changing the way that the government borrows from short term to long term, and it, would that really just exasperate the incentive system for policymakers and just expanding the benefits? And you know, I, I've seen some very interesting takes with like, I think Stephanie Kelton's, the deficit myth, 
And uh, there seems to be this new change where they just think, oh, it doesn't matter at all. I know you talked about it a little bit, but I would just love to hear you expand. Yeah, yeah. yeah my, my sense is that on the margin, it might matter in some cases whether you borrow short or borrow long, depending upon the economy that you're in, right? Uh, we've been living in this world where uh, real long rates have been very, very low for a decade. And so it makes sense then to, uh, when you're uh, refinancing maturing debt or incurring new debt to put it into those long range, uh, long range uh, securities, right? Now with an inverted yield curve, you've got the same kind of phenomenon at work. But again, I want to come back to this point is don't think so much about the debt being the problem and how we should finance this expenditure. We should be thinking about reducing the expenditure because ultimately that's where the harm comes from. Because once you spend that dollar, you've got to borrow, and maybe it matters whether you borrow long or borrow short, but you've got to borrow to finance it, or you've got a tax to finance it. And so when you think about the nature of this problem, keep going back to, uh, to the spending side uh, and think of these two as two means of financing, both which have some economic harm given the structure of spending. Um, hi, good morning. My name is Valerie. I'm a student at Cornell College. Um, I know that today's talk mostly focused on the Affordable Care Act and Social Security as major spenders and entitlement programs. However, I did notice um, something that was interesting to me was that you said that we needed to cap eligib eligibility for means-tested programs, particularly for welfare programs for the needy and the people in poor. My question was just, how would you suggest going about um, going about this? For example, I'm thinking of TANF, which caps people, um, caps people at five years and aren't able to reapply. And I'm thinking about how it has become dif more difficult across time to um, qualify for TANF and receive TANF assistance. So I was just curious as to your um, what what exactly. It, what exactly you mean by capping the means tested? Yeah, programs. very good. So we do cap eligibility for all means tested entitlement programs, right? We cap food stamps at 130% of the poverty line. Uh, I think we cap uh, the ACA at 400% of the poverty line. So each of these programs provides benefits well in excess of what we thought their objective was which was to alleviate poverty. So my point is just we have to reduce the eligibility levels for those programs to provide fewer benefits for the middle class, right? I think you could provide benefits to, like I said, you're spending five times the amount of money uh, that we need to eliminate poverty in the United States. So I think we want to, if we're going to solve the budget problem, one component should be to reduce the level of eligibility, uh, the income eligibility level for these programs down to, it could be to 130% of poverty, could be 120%. In my calculations, I think I said 200% of poverty should be the, the limit, okay? It doesn't mean that all programs are, have this high eligibility thresholds. The ACAs is very, very high. Food stamps is kind of like in the middle. TANF, which is really set at the state level, uh, often uh, below the poverty line. Um, SSI, Supplemental Security Income, is right around the poverty line. So they're varying, varying levels, and I just say take the whole group of programs and try to coordinate them and, and limit the eligibility to 200% of poverty, uh, and along with those Medicare and Social Security changes, you'll, you'll have an effect. And you have to keep in mind this, that as much as we want to provide assistance to the poor or to the middle class, when we do so through means-tested entitlement programs or any means-tested program, we create disincentives for work, for improving oneself. We now impose, if you will, a financial penalty associated with getting ahead. It is inevitable. You can't get away from it. It's a fact of life in these programs because you, every one of these programs says, if you are poor, you get a basic benefit call it $1,000 a month. But then after your income rises above some level, we're going to start phasing down those benefits. And that phase down then imposes a penalty, a tax penalty, on your effort for work and for investments in human capital. Because each dollar you make ends up reducing the level of benefits in the programs 
that you're receiving the benefits from. And that acts as a tax, it reduces the after-tax wage, if you will, for people. And so again, it's, there's no black and white here, but you've got to have a balance between the help that you're providing individuals and then the costs associated with providing that help and the work disincentives and the disincentives for family formation or advancements in one's human capital, those are real and they just they can't be dismissed. But again, it's balance that we're trying to seek. And I tried to show you with those numbers that I think we've gotten a little bit out of balance. That's all. <laughs> Hi, sir. My name is Karina. Thank you for your presentation. So I know this question may not be welcomed, but um, my question regards to like immigration trends and specifically waves of undocumented uh, migrants. Is there any like correlation between that's the spending and, and those trends and like specifically specifically in California, we know uh, we have generous programs for undocumented persons or their children. Um, but again, that's another expenditure. So just your thoughts on that. That's a good, good question. Um, so at the federal level, uh, most undocumented uh, individuals are not eligible for benefits, right? Um, at California, they are. And of course, educational expenses just rise for a community uh, substantially when you have a group of undocumented workers. Um, so there, there, there's a, there is a, a budget issue. But again, uh, undocumented workers provide an enormous benefit to our society. They always have. Uh, and what makes, uh, to me, what makes immigration so, such a difficult issue is the provision of benefits to individuals that are fairly generous. And that is what, if you had a system where individuals that wanted to work could come here and work, uh, I doubt that there would be much uh, pushback against uh, immigration, legal or illegal. Uh, but when, a, when it overwhelms a community, uh, because you have undocumented workers who now a lot of the undocumented workers that come to the United States aren't getting work permits. And so there's no means by which they can contribute to the community and that creates this, this bit of tension. But again, these, these undocumented workers, so many of them are beneficial to society, uh, but they also come with a cost and what you're trying to do is sort of balance the two in any event. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Great. I really appreciate it.